Hi, my name is Vanessa Leck, and today is going to be an interview with military veteran and business owner, Aliyah Ingall. So Aliyah, can you tell us about your background and the journey that led you to where you are today? Oh man, I love that you call it a journey because it really was. <laughs> I, uh, I grew up uh, raised by two army parents. And as, as much as I hated moving all the time, I said, I'm never going to join the military. As soon as I turned 19, I said, I'm absolutely joining the military. <laughs> and so I went air force and, uh, I spent 21 years in the air force. And after I retired, I decided what I want to be when I grow up is a biz business owner. And that was one thing that I never thought in a million years. That's, that's, who I was, but that's where I ended up and, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. So I didn't know that you were raised by military parents that you came from a military family. I do as well. And so it's really interesting because I keep citing the stat that I read, which is about 80% of people who join the military come from these military families. And so mm -hmm. you're in the same boat as well. And so I had a military base, albeit a smaller one than, you know, Fort Liberty, formerly known as Fort Bragg, where I'm now why I was brought to North Carolina. Yeah. But did you have a military base where you lived and where you were growing up as well? Is that another component you think or no? Um well the one that I the remember the one that I remember most was uh Fort Hood, which is now Fort Cavazos in Colleen, Texas. Um that is the majority of what I remember from my childhood and it was just so familiar to me that it wasn't it almost seemed the natural choice to go military just like my parents. Okay. So you had a big military base then near where you live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It. Was the military service, and you said you moved around, but like, was the, the bulk of their service after you were born and when you can remember it or before you were born? Cause with my mother, it was before I was born. Mm. Most of it. Yeah. The majority was after, uh, I was born very, very early within my mom's career, and I just kind of followed her along her career. So she was in 20 years, and so I was born probably three years into her career. So I was there for the majority of it. Okay. So you said that you were wanting to open a business and be a business owner since you were very young. And so what inspired you to focus on promoting a healthy work culture as your current company basically not just in but as your current company because well tell us a little bit about what you do in your company kind of explain it because i'm not yeah. too familiar with this type of company yeah so work culture work culture is kind of everything right it's it can be anything from how your management handles things versus um the, the way that your desks are organized all the way to how your onboarding is processed in your organization. And work culture is actually a very new phenomenon. A lot, most organizations don't even recognize it as, as, as an entity until within maybe the last five years or so. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this is because I experienced workplace bullying I experienced it so severe to a level that, and I don't think a lot of people realize how impactful the the workplace bullying can be to somebody, how, how, how far it can push you into a place where that feels unfamiliar and really scary and very alone and almost uh, hopeless. And that's what workplace bullying can do to you. And so my survival story from the workplace bullying is to help others so that they don't have to experience the same kind of traumatic event. So I'm very familiar with workplace bullying, thanks to U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Rampant in that organization, Veterans Health Administration. Now, and I covered that in my book, Veterans Affairs, Whistleblower Retaliation. Uh, kind of painstaking detail, or at least it was for me to have to edit it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. you know, some of the stuff I learned in my research of it after experiencing really all of the bad behavior you could experience at workplace, I feel like I experienced at the VA, um, was that women are more likely than men to be targeted by workplace bullying and women that are considered to be competent and intelligent um, and proficient in their work duties are more likely to be targeted. It oftentimes comes from a superior that feels uh, threatened 
by the proficiency of one of their subordinates. And then, of course, the bullying can lead to mobbing, which is like bullying on steroids. Yeah. And yeah. that is just really talk about a toxic work environment. That'll really do it to you. Yeah. And I really think, too, when you talk about work culture, you know, the sad reality is I think it's been around, you know, forever, but at the same time for many, many eons. But the reality is, is that certain people that own certain companies that manage certain work environments intentionally make it a toxic place because they just don't care. Right. You know, it's really the, the mental health care industry, which is ironic given the word health, you know, <laughs> is in that title there, our industry. And, you know, I've talked at length about it in other podcasts about, you know, mental health sweatshops and how badly mental health workers are cre um, treated. Same goes for nurses. It's really common in the healthcare industry. And then a lot of people, I'm sure it's in other industries too, but I know nurses and mental health professionals burn out within five years never to return. Oh. So anyways, so how do you balance the demands of, you know, your current work with your personal well-being? You really, you really do have to prioritize your own needs. And, and the thing about a lot of us is we are so, so good at sacrificing our own needs for the greater good. We think that we're falling on the sword for the, for the mission. And, but what we're really doing is hurting the mission because if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't identify our own needs and make sure they're being met, the mission is never going to get met. If anything, we're hurting the mission. So it's really important that we identify those breaks that we have to take, those those moments that where we have to, where we have to identify. All right, I need to step back for just a minute. This is becoming too much. How do you think the concept of healthy work culture has evolved over the years? Because I know you said just in the last five years you feel like it's become more of a thing. But what do you think of the evolution beyond the five year time frame? Yeah, honestly, I think. I, I really think COVID has changed everything. COVID revamped how the workplace even looks nowadays, where before COVID, asking for a remote was unheard of. It was, who do you, who do you think you are to feel so entitled to a remote job? Whereas now it's like, you better bring something else to the table if you want me to actually come in the office. <laughs> And that's just the way it is now. People understand that we don't have to put up with abuse anymore. We don't have to tolerate the long hours. Uh, I think because of COVID, people are now recognizing our our rights as employees, you know? I mean, well, I hope that's, that that's the case. I mean, I sincerely yeah. hope that that's the understanding and the case across the board because I've never seen that to be the case ever. I've never <laughs> seen that. Um, but I really do hope it is. I mean, I know in my own industry, in the mental health care industry, pre-COVID, so like 2018 leading up to that, um, I was I had opened uh, my first private practice and I was seeing clients and I was seeing them hybrid. And so I had a physical office in the city in downtown Raleigh. And then I also had, you know, the online component. And... Um, I didn't start out thinking I'd be doing the hybrid, but I went ahead and was like, it just kind of naturally happened. Because I had some people that basically lived too far to commute to my office physically. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that was the only way to get seen. And then we had a natural disaster. And so there were a bridge I needed to travel to was flooded. So I couldn't even get to my office. Oh my <clears> power was out in some of the places and stuff like that. And so the only way some of these people could be seen was online. So I ended up doing like hybrid. Some people were in person, some people were online, some people were both. And I remember the attitude from some of my peers was you would not believe, I won't repeat some of the things they told me. It was so bad. Oh they were my. so horrified that I was seeing anyone online for any reason at all in, in any capacity. It was just so just like far out there. Like I was doing, like I, I you would think I'd tell, I was telling them it was new space travel. Like that might've been more well accepted. <laughs> um, and then of course, you know, I went completely online out of necessity because of the military spouse dysfunctional lifestyle of moving and stuff. And, uh, then it was right before the whole COVID thing happened. And then all of a sudden, you know, everything, you know, had played out and happened. And now what's wild is 2024, you know, I'm, I'm, start a new prayer practice and back in it this year. And I'm just blown away because now it's like, 
the volume of private practices and practitioners are only working online. It's everywhere. It's largely normalized. It's amazing. But insurance companies don't want to cover a lot of this stuff no. doing it online. They want to not pay out for that mental health care. So, yeah, I mean, I just think it's really interesting how it's changed the Internet, you know, the acceptance of it. No, absolutely. And I and I think one of the most the biggest benefit from from this change is now that there's a work life balance that we can work with. A lot of us that work from home, that remote work allows us to balance the things that we haven't been able to to carry and, and identify when we were still spending an hour on the road just to get to the job. And then we're at the job all day and then another hour on the road just to get home. Our day is gone. We have no way to handle anything. But now that these remote options are here, that that work life balance is actually available and, and reachable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be. I've heard of horror stories too, though, of employees being monitored in so mm -hmm. a micromanaging way remotely. Mm -hmm. That I heard of a story through a podcast I was listening to where a person was fired because the the time that they logged wasn't sufficient, even though they got all this work done right. that they were supposed to get done. It, they weren't hanging on their computer. The, so it's like I can see where there's a lot of room for basically cyber abuse as well, because I know I saw that again back to VA Veterans Health Administration. I dealt with cyber bullying and abuse um, through in that workplace. Yeah. And online, you know, yeah. and so I, now with all the new technology, I imagine that's going to be I can only imagine the workplace harassment legal actions that are going to be in the evidence, digital forensic evidence that's going to be utilized in the future about this. Cause it's no longer going to be like John Doe, Jane Doe in this workplace, you know, X, Y, Z street. It's going to be like, you know, the compu forensic computer evidence, digital oh, evidence. Oh, great. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I tell people all the time, if, if you are applying to a company that uses the tracking devices on your mouse to determine how much your mouse moves. Don't just leave now, just leave now because you're not even uh, respected as an individual adult at that point. If they're tracking your mouse movements, we're done. Yeah. You got to go. <laughs> There's a lot of that. I mean, I think that's like the future as far as like the um, disputes and different things, because even like newer vehicles I'd heard, through one of the social media channels, this attorney that's on there was talking about how some vehicle makers have some kind of like GPS in there that they were handing over to certain insurance companies that are asking for it. And they were using that data to increase premiums on drivers that way by saying mm. that your, your data reveals basically you're a bad driver. Anyways, and now they're trying to get apps for uh, insurance companies. Some of them I've seen advertised trying to get drivers to download apps to track themselves while they're driving so they can report back and get a discount nope. in insurance. But we all know how this is going to turn out. Yeah. It's not going to turn out well, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it probably. You're not going to get a discount at all. It's not going to happen that way. <laughs> so yeah, there's pros and there's cons. That's for sure. I just know for me, one of the things I noticed when I had my hybrid practice several years ago and before I went completely online was it was just kind of a breath of fresh air to in between sessions and work that I was doing to be able to come out, go out of my office and, you know, um, let my dog outside or do some things I normally wouldn't be able to do at, you know, the actual mm -hmm. office. So yeah. that that's nice. Now, self-care, what does that look like to you? Cause I know you said you have to prioritize taking breaks, but what is like, what is, cause everybody says something different about what self-care looks like to them. Sure. And so subjective what, what would you say it is for you it's very subjective for me I love to journal I love I it's the the best way for me to be able to get my thoughts out in a safe place in a way mm -hmm. that's not going to get me in trouble <laughs> we all have those thoughts and we all want to be able to say those things and sometimes we don't have a way to get those things out in a in a safe place uh, environment where it's not going to harm anyone, including ourselves. And so journaling for me is, is very therapeutic and it allows me to get the things out that are holding me down. And then I can go back and move forward in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. 
No, that's really good. I mean, a lot of people do find journaling to be helpful. I mean, it's high, it comes highly recommended in a lot of um, by a lot of therapists and stuff with people that they work with. So mm -hmm. whatever works for you. <laughs> do you have a personal mantra or motto or kind of thing that guides your approach to work and life? Like, for example, mine is, and this is it always takes people back, but uh, it's just different things I've lived through. Uh, justice delayed is justice denied. That mm. is something that I really, that's a, that's yeah. the thing I, I'd stick that, stick something in an email or on a website about a quote, that would be it. It's a legal maxim. Justice delayed Agreed. is justice denied. So what would yours be? Mine is accountability is uncomfortable. I've heard you say that before, actually. Yeah. I think I've seen you, maybe you wrote it somewhere. Yeah. I say it a lot. It's, uh, it's, and, and it, 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 it's kind of my mantra, but it also keeps me in check too, because we have to remember that sometimes the reason we fight, sometimes the reason we argue is because we don't want to acknowledge that we actually played a part in the problem. Too many times fights happen because we are uncomfortable with that introspective thought. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so sometimes when I see, you know, conflicts happen, I have to stop and say, okay, how much of this am I truly accountable for? And you have to be willing to say, it's possible that I'm accountable for all of this, mm -hmm. or it's possible that I really truly am not accountable for any of this. I'm just a side, you know, I'm on the, on the sidelines trying to keep up. But the majority of the time, when you look at scenarios, there's a very good chance that there's a portion that you are accountable for and you just don't want to accept it. Yeah. No, I understand that. You know, I think about that, what you just said, I think about um, how I've learned through the years, which has been uncomfortable for me, is mm -hmm. about how <clears throat> systemic dysfunction tends to protect certain people that are just abusive yes. and how um, a lot of times I've learned kind of the hard way and just my own observations, research experience, that when you see one person behaving badly, whether it be in, I was just saying a system, it could be an organization, it could be a, an actual mm -hmm. system, like a legal system, that typically it's not just one person, it's a symptom of a larger problem Absolutely. that encourages this kind of, and perpetuates this kind of behavior. And so, I mean, I've seen that in large federal agencies. I've seen, I see it a lot in the government. Uh, I see mm -hmm. it in the American legal system, federal civil yep. service system, Carolina legal system, where certain systems and people and organizations of power are able to maintain power, even if they shouldn't have that power, mm -hmm. and then perpetuate abuse and oppression upon loads of people. Yep. And yep. so I think systemic accountability is really important to yeah. get down to the individual level. Why would anyone want or need to feel the to feel the accountability if the people around them or the people above them aren't doing it either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't have and a need to. Enables. It was called the loudest voice in the room. Did you ever see it? No, it a, but I want to movie. now. <laughs> it, it, it's probably pretty triggering. So brace yourself. Okay. But it was extremely interesting. And so it was a true story, um, well done. And uh, basically it talked about, you know, a specific, some harassment, some illegal behavior in a workplace at a, at a news station network that is well known. I'm not kidding. Well, cases like these are usually on the victims. I saw the culture of Fox. I can see what my own TV project was about the harasser. showed how kind of insidious harassment can be, how long-term it can be, how people can behave badly. And I see this, you know, in the legal system as well throughout an entire career before anyone ever decides to step in and do anything. And it's only after, you know, crazy amount of damage has been done to, you know, countless lives and, mm -hmm. um, and about how, you know, abusers are protected by systemic systems, basically, you know, it's yeah. not, and I truly believe that I truly believe it's not just ever typically, one person, whether it be a community or organization or whatever, it's they have these this group of enablers around them, protecting them, lying yep. for them, yep. uh, diminishing things, paying people off, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it really it kind of showed some of those elements 
in in that show and i just thought it was really interesting you know i thought it was something that translates really well to a lot of different um situations another one do you remember that movie disclosure with michael douglas and demi moore no you should watch that one too it's another one like the 1990s and i actually covered that in my workplace um like violence i did a video and basically Demi Moore is harassing, to say the very least, which terrorizing Michael Douglas. They have the characters, can rename the characters. And there is this wonderful woman who plays the attorney, and she says, No, because you act like it's some kind of game. Mr. Sanders, why are you here? I want to know what my options are. What your options are? I want to know whether I can sue her for sexual harassment. Well, to do that, you'd have to convince the jury that you were alone in a room with Miss teenage New Mexico, and you said no. Sexual harassment is not about sex. It is about power. She has it, you don't. If you sue, you'll never get another job in the computer business. If you don't sue, they'll bury you in Austin. If you sue, it's news. If you don't, it's gossip. If you sue, nobody will believe you. If you don't, your wife won't. They will make your life into a living hell for the next three years until this case goes to trial. And for that privilege, it's going to cost you a minimum of $100,000. Do you not think it's a game, Mr. Sanders? It's a game to them. How do you feel about losing? Anyways, I encourage you to check it out because unfortunately what that attorney, actor attorney was saying in that movie and the way things were playing out in the movie still play out to this day still in rings a, true. Yeah, the situations. It still rings true. And that was in the 1990s when I was a little kid. You know, I'm 38 now. Yeah. So like 30 years later, it still rings true. Ugh. That's just sad that even in tw in what 20 years maybe maybe more we still haven't progressed enough to make employees feel safe from that it was like 30 stuff. years 30 years well i think there's a certain level of safety employees feel but then when they get to the legal system try to uphold their only um civil rights because it's really what we're talking about here are civil rights yeah yeah. Right, scared the citizens in a civilized society is the exact definition of civil rights, which most people don't seem to know that they turn into what they want to turn it into. Yeah. Anyways, but God help you trying to enforce your civil rights in this country and this legal system. All right. So moving on to another Ooh. fun topic, divorce. Um, yeah. So can you tell us about your experiences with divorce and how it influenced your overall outlook on life? You know, a lot of people go through divorce, you know, half the nation. And then I always find it so interesting because some of the people get divorced and get remarried a second time. And then, you know, then a third time and, and some fourth or fifth time. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so it's, it, I'm always interested in these topics. Yeah. There's so many expectations when it comes to divorce. And I think those expectations have shifted throughout the years, right? So um, my mom, growing up with my mom, she was married and divorced twice. And, really? and in, the, in, in the 80s, even back then, it wasn't as nearly as common as it is today. But even back then, it wasn't unheard of. When mm -hmm. you think of, you know, before her time, it was just, you know, if you got divorced, gasp. <laughs> How could you possibly do that? And today, like you said, we're doing it four or five times. And it's almost yeah. like the, as as we are kids growing up, seeing this, that, that this is the expectation that's that's what we're learn, learning now that that's the expectation it's we we don't get divorced to be with that person forever or we don't get married to be with that person forever it's because divorce is always an option and i'm not sure that that's the way we should be looking at things divorce actually mm -hmm. should be there for those scenarios where you gave it your best shot and it didn't work out but man i really think that some people just look at it as oh well it didn't work out throw in the towel or get divorced again it's almost like we don't even even try. We don't we we just we just we know there's a way out now almost. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so I mean people were getting divorced multiple times even way before nowadays. Mm -hmm. There's different stats that fluctuate. All these stats fluctuate, but there seems to be some evidence that people are getting married less now than mm -hmm. in years past. Interesting. Because there's yeah, there's different types of, as you know, relationships happening, live-in situations happening, whatever the case. I mean, there's yeah. so many different things um, that are on the table that weren't before. I mean, even things like 
polyamory and things like that. I mean, you can't get married to like five people. So like <laughs> that, right. reason, if you're in that kind of relationship, you might not get married to anyone at all. But, um, you know, the, the divorce laws are so challenging in this country and they vary state to state. Like in North Carolina is much harder to get a divorce than say in Florida, you know, where mm. in Florida it's roughly not a lawyer, it's not legal advice. I've not been to law school. If you need legal advice, go find it. Disclaimer. Okay? <laughs> but in Florida, you know, where I was a mediator for a little bit, a um, couple of years, I learned that basically the minimum time was like 30 days, right, to get a divorce. But of course, it usually took people longer than that because of paperwork and getting things yeah. together and different things. In North Carolina, it is not like that at all. I mean, I forget how long is North Carolina. I swear to God, I thought I saw two years the other day. But before oh, wow. that, I thought, I thought I saw a year. It was a year for the longest time, unless they changed it. So the, for the longest time, you had to be legally separated for a year, which meant living at different addresses. Now, I don't know if they increased that to two years. I feel, I swear to God, I feel like I read that somewhere, but I could be totally wrong. I mean, it just feel like maybe like a nightmare. I don't know. I'm not yeah. sure. But in Florida, you don't have to live at separate addresses to get your divorce. You know what I mean? And so every state's different. And some of these states, like, require two years That's of legal insane. separation. Ooh, yeah, it depends. I mean, so it's easy to get married and it's really hard to get divorced, you know? Agreed, yeah. And depending where you're at in the country. And can you imagine if you told someone it would take them, you had to have a two year wedding pair to get married? Can you oh imagine? Oh, gosh. It would never happen. <laughs> you have a lot less marriages. See, by the time people got married, they'd be like, or re qualified, they'd be like, I changed my mind. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, that may not be a bad thing. <laughs> no, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing, but just the point, you know. Right, right. right. Um, so what ways do you think divorce can impact a person's approach to work and relationships? Man. I mean, the thing about divorce is it can it can give you both positive and negative expectations, right? Because it, it can give you that negative outlook of, oh, well, it was probably going to end up in divorce anyway. But it could also tell you, it could also teach you that I can give it my best shot. An absolutely worst case scenario, there is a way out if I don't succeed. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is important too, because it's like, you know, people shouldn't have to be miserable. You know, it, I really truly believe at this point in my life that, you know, most of these relationships, marriages, whatever you want to call them, you know, if you're married or committed relationship, let's mm -hmm. say marriage, are destined to end before they begin based upon personality types alone. I think yeah. that some of these personality traits are just hardwired, baked in. And if you have incompatible personality types, it's just never going to work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think there's only so many things that you, people can change, you know, like for example, my husband and I, we have opposite personalities. It's a good thing. In it's a, lot a of good ways. thing. Yeah. It usually is. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But if we didn't and we had identical personalities, I mean, I think that would have ended a long time ago. Might've been, I mean, we both had, matching personalities we couldn't have been in that show called snapped <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah talk about wrong, the example of the wrong personalities meeting jesus <laughs> yeah um what would you say to someone going through a divorce while managing their career trying to keep their career going through all that oh man I've, I've done that once, um, going through my, my, my divorce through the first, from, through my first marriage. And the hardest thing to remember is it's going to be okay. When you're going through it, it feels like this is the worst thing you've ever felt in your life. I don't ever know. I don't know how I'm going to get to the end of this, but mm -hmm. the most important thing that I remembered was it's going to be okay. Once I get to the other side of this. Yeah. And I'm going to be stronger and better. So did you have a waiting period before you could um, finalize your divorce? Was there any kind of legal separation waiting period that you had to contend with at all in your situation? You know, I divorced in Florida. So for me, it was kind of easy. It, it was, 
you yeah <laughs> it was florida so it was count yourself lucky count over. yourself lucky <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it like wasn't hard at all. You were the, your waiting period was over. Like, <laughs> I didn't even notice it. Yeah. Are there any misconceptions people have about divorce that you'd like to address? I, I think okay. I think that uh, a lot of parents, um, they underestimate how much it impacts the kids. A lot of people think that, oh, they'll be fine as long as I stay fine. But what they don't see is that kids notice and remember everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. Um, to the little things that the parents say to the kids that think that it's just, it's nothing. They'll remember it forever. Yeah. And it seems like it really varies. I think it goes back to personality as well and other environmental factors about how much it affects some children more than others. Mm -hmm. And also because there's so many more people getting divorced, like you mentioned, I think that kind of factors into it where you know, it's not stigmatized like what once was like, it's not unheard of, you know, like you're gonna be the only kid in the school that's going through that. So I mean, that's one positive, I'd say. But yeah, it widely varies. I've heard from adults I've talked about, which of course, this would be about 30 years ago, yeah. um, that have really were re got really messed up from their parents divorce. So I don't know what was going on in that situation. But <laughs> I, uh, it wasn't good, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, for a long time, I really struggled with my parents' divorce, especially because my mom got divorced twice. So I had a, a, a bio dad and a stepdad that I had to say goodbye to. And that was really hard for six-year-old Aaliyah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I would imagine that would be, it sounds like you actually remember it too, which is more than I can say of my six-year-old memories. Um, yeah. So... Were there any things that you took away that you learned from, you know, going through the divorce process in any way, shape or form, like whether it be the legal side or financial side or emotional or just relationships in the future or work related to the stuff related to all that? I don't know how this would, how this would translate to other people, but I know for me, um, I really disconnected from my mom. Um, you know, both times she got divorced, my brother and I stayed with her. She had sold custody both times, but I really disconnected from her, especially after the second one. Um, she had, she and I did not have a very good relationship after the second divorce. But for me, I always remembered, even as a kid, I kept thinking it's okay that my mom and I aren't close because I have two amazing dads who, who can say they have two dads. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for me, I was always looking at the positive side of it, of, you know, this is awesome. I have something to brag about that no one else can say. <laughs> I have two dads. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really good that you were able to take some positives away from it because not everyone's able to. So that's really good. I mean, it's good though. It sounds like you get a lot of support too, supportive adults around you. Yeah. So it's not always the case. Sorry. No, it's definitely not always the case. It's usually not the case, unfortunately. Yeah. So what final thoughts or advice would you like to share about creating a healthy work culture or navigating life's challenges? I think remembering that accountability is uncomfortable is very important, but embrace it when you can. And also, this is this is a, a phrase that I use all the time that it's it's an old phrase, but it really still carries true to this day is when you are doing anything, when you are encountering conflict with another person, when there you've got a workplace situation, a relationship situation, it's all the same. Listen to understand, not to respond. Try mm -hmm. to see from their perspective. Reverse it. If mm -hmm. this were reversed, would you feel the same way? What upcoming projects or initiatives are you excited about? Oh, man. So I recently got involved with the Mission Continues program. It's the Women's Veterans Leadership Program. It's incredible. Um, you, 
you basically you send a, you group up with 70 other vet, women veterans and you learn about healing and coping and you become besties with 69 other veteran women and it's an incredible mission but the most important part is at the end of the cohort you pitch your cause so when you find a cause that you are are invested in and you want to promote and you want to bring attention to you pitch this idea on how you can get others involved. And so for me, my pitch is going to be about workplace bullying and pushing that legislation across the remaining 34 states. We have 16 states right now that are that have uh, provided legislation for against workplace bullying. So we need 30 more that we're going to go on. We're going to push that. So that's mine. But the mission continues. I'm telling you, this is the greatest program I've ever been involved with. And I'm so excited to be a part of it. <laughs> You know what they're so it's women veterans initiative program. Do you do they have a website like that? You yeah. Have so it's there? on the the mission continues is the actual company, the nonprofit, and then the women's veterans leadership program is the actual um, program that's being ran by the mission continues. So if you okay. go to the mission continues website, you'll see it. It's it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life. How can people connect with you or learn more about the work that you do? Yeah, look me up on LinkedIn. You can do LinkedIn. And I also, I'm very active on Instagram as well. Okay. What is your handle on those two? Uh, work culture works, all one word. Okay, cool. And I'll go ahead and link that as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Leah, for everything and for all of your information and talking about the important topics that we've talked about. I definitely look forward to the legislation being passed. I know in Europe that they have legislation about this already, about things like coercive control and bullying and in, in the workplace, as well as domestic violence type stuff um, so that we don't have in America. So that would be refreshing. It'd be even more refreshing if maybe you know, people would proactively not do that. And, um, you know, if we could actually enforce, you know, some basic human rights over here, that'd be great. But, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for bringing more awareness to this. I encourage everyone to check out Aaliyah and the important work that she does. Hey. Thank you. Bye.